The gospel reading comes to us from John chapter 6, beginning in verse 35. Listen once again to the word of the Lord. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, said Jesus. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. It's good to be back with you. Thanks for having me again to preach. It's been very nice to see those of you I've had a chance to connect with. I would love to chat after the service as well. I used to be a big solo traveler, partly because I started traveling on the cheap before I had enough money to not stay in hostels, and my friends didn't want to do that. Partly, though, because I like being alone. But in the last few years, I've taken several trips with friends, ranging from one night to two and a half weeks earlier this summer. And it's always a gamble, you know? Are we gonna be okay after this? Are we gonna make it? If you can spend three days in a car with somebody, you're hungry and you're tired, and you end up in a bad hotel that you picked, and then you complain about it, (laughs) and you come home friends, honestly, you could probably marry that person and it would be fine. And having experienced it now a few times, I can tell you that what matters is that intuitive connection. You have to be able to sit in silence with that person, right? That person needs to be someone you would enjoy doing nothing with. You could fall asleep in the car while they're driving. And when you actually do those things, your relationship deepens. The friendship becomes more consequential Not because you talk yourself into thinking this person is a good candidate to be a friend, but because they are a friend. I want to ask you to think of this person in your life. There may be many if you are lucky, but this person, a spouse, a friend, a sibling, whomever. A person you can be quiet with, you can do nothing with, because you trust them completely. How did you get there? When did it happen? Why did it happen? James K.A. Smith, he's a philosopher at Calvin College, he wrote a blockbuster book a few years ago called You Are What You Love. And he argues that as Americans, we have a tendency to live as brains on a stick. It's a beautiful image, right? What he means by that is that we've absorbed a cultural value, partly out of the Enlightenment, but also stretching back thousands of years to the beginnings of Western philosophy and bolstered by our individualistic culture, our bootstraps culture. We've picked up this cultural value that says my thinking self, my reasoning self, is what really matters about who I am. That's where my self is. There's a higher and better and more eternal part of you that can't be touched or scientifically measured. That's the idea that we've all picked up to some degree that this is the real you and that your body Your stomach, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your fingers, they're all just 
kind of along for the ride, and they're not going to last. Now, we know that this is wrong because we worship a God who died on the cross and was resurrected, and we will follow him in his resurrection, but we have picked up this value that what we think is what really is. And what that means for Christianity is that many of us have reduced our religious faith, our allegiance to Christ, to intellectual assent to an idea. It certainly is that, but there's more to it. The idea is that if you can say the creed without crossing your fingers, then you believe in Jesus Christ. Now, you may have heard this before, but the New Testament Greek word for belief is pisteo, and it is much bigger than just belief. It encompasses belief, but it also encompasses trust and faithfulness. It's a much more relational word than belief. It means that in addition to believing, you trust Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought of it like that? That you are faithful to Jesus Christ. As you are thinking over these next few weeks about what it means for Christ to be present in the church, Another way of saying this is that we are here to develop that relationship that allows you to move from I believe that Jesus can be trusted to I trust Jesus. We are here to be on a long road trip with Jesus, to stand in his kitchen and make dinner together while everybody else is at the beach, to spend an hour in a hospital room in silence with Jesus. We are here to know him so well that we would trust him not just with our brains, but with our whole selves. The growth over time of that relationship comes through experiences of togetherness, experiences of friendship. Jesus says, I have not called you servants, I have called you friends. It requires, like any friendship you can imagine, that you would offer yourself to him and he would offer himself to you. And this is the thing. You can't offer Christ to anyone inside the church or outside the church until you have been transformed by trusting him. So how does this happen? Well, in theology, we call these ways in which Christ reliably offers himself again and again by the Holy Spirit. We call these things the means of grace. There are two that we always receive at church, the word and prayer, and we should experience those elsewhere too, alone and with others. But there are two that we receive only in the company of other Christians, ordinarily only at church, and those are the sacraments of baptism and communion. In our passage today, Jesus again says these strange things about being the bread of life. There's been quite a bit in John to this point about bread and water. And now he's talking about eating his body. And this sounds to us probably very religious and pretty normal, right? Because the Eucharist is possibly one of the most consequential things in the history of Western thought. It's had an enormous impact on history. But way back at the beginning, when Jesus first told his followers that they needed to eat his body and drink his blood, when the early Christians were suspected of a cannibalistic cult, Back then, it was very surprising, and it was very troubling. And I want to talk today about what this means, what it tells us about what God is doing in our world and in you, what happens when we gather at the table. So Jesus tells them about the manna, which we also read about today. He reminds them about the bread that rained down from heaven to sustain the Israelites in the wilderness. And that is a prototype, in a way, of what is happening here. If you recall the story of the woman at the well, it was two chapters ago, another moment where Jesus says, I can give you living water. These are sacramental interactions where we are getting a clue as to why God has chosen to sustain us spiritually with physical things. In between these two stories, there are two healings. Jesus feeds 5,000 people and he walks on water. He exercises authority over the ordinary elements of the physical world, lifting the veil on the new creation. And in the middle of that sequence of stories, he claims the life and authority and judgment and power of the Father. That oneness 
of the Father and the Son pervades our text today. And all of this is really important to understanding what happens at the communion table. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one can come to me unless the Father draws them. There is unity of life and purpose and being in the relationship of Father and Son and Spirit, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. That oneness, that unity, is what we are being invited into, not just at the table, but in all of Christian discipleship. The love of God that enfolds and defines us. So when we think about the sacraments, this is key, that part of what is happening here is an offering of God, an offering of himself. It is the love of God, but it's in this way that you would receive and be filled with the fullness of God, as Ephesians says, that he would offer himself to you. And we begin each communion service and have for hundreds of years with the sursum corda. That means in Latin, lift up your hearts. We offer ourselves as he is offering himself. And we are joined to Christ, becoming part of his body as the spirit lives in us. That same encircling fellowship with God is uniting everyone at this table and at every celebration of the Eucharist all over the world in every age. At this table, a true miracle takes place. Not something we call a miracle because it's cool, but one of those times when the veil is drawn back from the new creation. Jesus says in verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. And this is a quote from Isaiah, I think it's 54. And the context is that desolate Jerusalem will be restored. Its glory and its righteousness and its relationship with God will be healed. And its children will be taught by the Lord. Those who are taught by the Lord come to Jesus. This is a new creation passage. The fundamental breakdown of the world in our relationships with God, with other, with self and with creation, we could call that sin. All those relationships are being slowly, carefully, truly rebuilt and repaired at this table. You will be called repairers of the breach. It's a horizontal and vertical miracle. There are a few major ways of thinking about communion in theology, and I just want to give you broad strokes on three of them so that we have a better sense of the theological question. If you were to put all the Christians in the world into two camps on communion, there would be a sacramental camp and an ordinal camp. Baptists, Anabaptists, and a lot of non-denominational churches, frankly a fair number of American Protestants of all kinds, fall into the ordinal camp. Baptism and communion are ordinances instituted by God for the sake of remembrance and self-dedication. You are the active party in a baptism, saying yes to Jesus. You are the active party in communion, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacramental camp includes pretty much everybody else, Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist, everybody else. Um, And this says that in the sacraments, we are responding to something that God is doing. God is the initiator and the active party And it's a miraculous meeting of heaven and earth every single time we faithfully celebrate a sacrament. So it's key that we would do it reverently. We would do it carefully and without any nonsense. So we should not be doing squirt gun baptisms. We should not be having Mountain Dew and Funfetti cake for communion. Both of those things have happened. We come to sacraments with reverence and care because God is truly active. We don't use things that will kill us, like neon green chemicals and fake guns, to meet God in a life-giving miracle. But also, we don't stray from how God has told us to do it, because he is truly here, and it is his offering of himself to us. The question of how he is here was huge in the Reformation, as I'm sure you know. And I just want to explain this, maybe a little in the weeds, but I think it's important. The difference between Catholic 
and reformed Presbyterian theology on this question is about the nature of that real presence. It's not about that there is real presence. We both believe that. It's about the nature of that real presence. The doctrine of transubstantiation in the Catholic Church says that the bread and wine change into the body and blood of Christ in such a way that it's right for us to bow down to it, to venerate it. It would be unthinkable to pour it down the drain or even to touch it in a way that is unworthy. It's physically present, and how this is explained has to do with Aristotle. Aristotle has a system of substance and accidents. So every physical object has this objective being, an ontology, an essential being. And every physical object also has accidents, things that are true about it, things that describe it, but that don't affect its central being. So I am substantially a human being, like all of you. I am accidentally blonde, well, fake blonde, and female, which makes me look different from many other people, right? So we've got in Catholic belief a substance change without an accident change. The bread and wine lose their breadness and their wineness, and they gain bodiness and bloodness. But their accidents remain, and so to our eyes, they don't change. And in Reformed theology, when we eat and drink of the bread and wine, the body and blood is given to us, but we are lifted into heaven to receive it. The miracle doesn't happen in the bread and wine. They are ordinary and they remain ordinary. The miracle happens when you are met by God for spiritual nourishment. We do partake of that substance, but we believe that we are lifted up an outward sign, as Augustine says, of an inward grace. So when Christ offers himself to you and to everyone around you, whether you like them or not, you lift up your heart and he offers himself. He becomes part of you in a way that you can see, and you become part of him. As this reciprocity happens again and again, you are transformed more and more into a person who trusts Jesus as a member of this whole body in whom the same thing is happening. This is why the early Christians took communion every week. It's why Calvin wanted communion every week. It's not a sacrifice on the altar because Christ's sacrifice was once for all. But in another sense, what has been offered to God, my flesh for the life of the world, is now being offered to you eat of it and live forever. We are entering into the story of God with the world and we are receiving Christ offered to us. It's new every time. As Calvin says, we, that we might gather new vigor until we reach the heavenly immortality. The miracle does not get old. That in your body, your full self, not just the rational mind, but your whole self, you would be built up into the image of Christ. God invites you into oneness, into renewed and healed relationship with him, into friendship and trust with him. Watch this process in our text of the Father giving you to Jesus, drawing you in so that you would be his, and Jesus giving himself to the Father so that he would be able to give himself to you. We are participating in the offering, remembering the sacrifice by receiving it. Here's Calvin one more time. Christ transfuses his life into us, just as if it penetrated our bones and marrow. Every single time is worth it. Every single time is a privilege. Every single time it draws you closer and nourishes your soul, and God offers himself. As you eat and drink here today, I want to challenge you to consider what would change in your life if you spent more time with Jesus in the means of grace. What could change for you if you knew him so well that simply enjoying him was enough? Every celebration of this sacrament is a step on that way. It is a miracle to be received in faith. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen.